sorry. Thank you everyone for joining uh, me today. I'm gonna present one of my, the chapters of my PhD dissertation um, is uh, Species Limits and Diversification of the Dendrupsophus rubicundulus subgroup. Anura highlight in the non-tropical savannas amesis. Um, I'll be the presenter with uh, my collaborators. Um, so the Dendropsoft rubicundulus subgroup uh, is characterized by small green tree frogs. And this group is comprises 11 species, which are distributed into species complexes. Uh, the Araguaia, the Dendropsophus Araguaia complex, and the Dendropsophus anataliasiasi complex. Um, uh, the species Dendropsophus uh, rea was not assigned in any of the groups, uh, just because of the lack of uh, information, like uh, genetic, morphological. But the previous work uh, decided to keep that species in this group. Uh, this group has a wide distribution in the Cerrado Savanna, and I'll explain a little bit more about the Cerrado Savanna for the people that don't know. And most of the species in this group, they are endemic to the Cerrado Savanna. Uh, the, taxonomy, the, the taxonomy of the group is complex because uh, species de descriptions in the past relied on dorsal striped patterns. And uh, with you know new studies, it was uh, it was pointed out that there is an undescribed diversity in evidence of morphological and uh, genetic variation. And um, particularly uh, with the Dendropsophus eliani uh, species, that is that previous studies showed that there is morphological and genetic variation. And the Dendrosophus rubicundulus and the Dendrosophus eliani, they both have a wide distribution in the Cerrado, so they probably have a um, um, some genetic population variation. So the Dendrosophus group, rubicundulus group, it, it has a somewhat similar morphology, as you can see in the pictures here. They are green and small, and they have some striped patterns. And using uh, these characteristics are not a good way to uh, describe them. So uh, the Neotropical Savannah, the Cerrado, is a uh, is in South America. And you can see in this map, the Cerrado is right in the middle of Brazil. And the Cerrado is surrounded by the Amazon and the Atlantic forest. There are humid and forest forested uh, biomes. And also surrounded by the Caatinga and the Chaco, which are dry biomes. The Cerrado uh, is influenced by the neighboring biomes with the species exchange and um, also, I also want to say that the Cerrado is a xeric vegetation, and uh, the vegetation ranges from grassland to forest formations, and the climate is highly seasonal with two well-defined seasons, the dry and the wet season. The Cerrado is also known as the second largest biome in South America and is a hotspot for uh, conservation due to the degradation rate that is higher than the Amazon and also the high levels of endemic species. As you can see in this map, uh, the purple and then yellow are habitat conversion and looks like 80% of the Cerrado was already converted to something else. So uh, talking about the biodiversity in the Cerrado, um, the Cerrado before was uh, mentioned or even considered poor because it just looks like a grassland. But with the intensification of studies in the region in the past uh, three decades, it was found that is the most diverse sav savanna in the world with um, a high level of endemic species with like 50% of amphibians and about 40 to 40% uh, of esclamates and plants being endemic. And when we see all that biodiversity, we ask why is Cerrado so biodiverse today? And to answer that question, we need to look uh, to uh, the past 
the evolutionary past of this dynamic landscape. And this biodiversity that we see today was influenced by geomorphological events that happened in the Nalgene around 23 to 2.5 million years ago. And also uh, the most important ones was the uplift of the Andes and the uplift of the Brazilian Shield. If you could see this map uh, of, uh, that you can see all the Amazon Sea, the Paranaense Sea, the Paraná Sea, when the Andes and the Brazilian Shield, they um, uplift, it promoted the formation of the Amazon River and the Chaco Paraná, Paraná Basin. Also, it promoted the uh, altitudinal gradient with the formation of plateaus and valleys, which uh, Made, made two different compartments that could harbor different types of species. Um, uh, another aspect that influenced the biodiversity was the climatic changes or the you know, climatic oscillations that happened during the quaternary, which was around 2.5 million ago to the present. And all this cold and dry versus warm and humid climatic conditions promoted habitat shifts, which promoted uh, expansion and retraction of the biome, as well as the uh, distribution of the species. So uh, for this um, work, I uh, looking all this uh, complex taxonomy and also the events that happened in the Cerrado in the past, I uh, have some hypotheses. So I expect to see uh, an indescribed diversity, at least for two species in this group, uh, Eliani and the Neuropsophs rubiculus. Also, I expect to see um, that the diversification of the endemic species in this group. They occurred during the Miocene and Pleistocene around 10 million years ago. And also that this species, those species are distributed in the plateaus as many of the Cerrado endemic species. So for the methods, I used um, 150 samples uh, of the species with, uh, with, that included seven, of the 11 species of this group. I used next generation sequencing and Sanger sequencing for that. Um, the analysis I, that I included geographic distribution, phylogenetic trees, um, genetic clustering, species delimitation methods, demography and time of divergency and the and bio uh, geographic history. I'm not gonna go in much details on the methods, but um, I'm going to show now a little bit of the results. So you can see here um, my 16S tree and my SNPs tree uh, that I generated uh, for this group of species. For my 16S, I was able to get samples, uh, uh, sequences from the gene bank. So it has more species than my SNPs tree. But I could see some similarities uh, and some difference. For example, if you look at the species, uh, the Neuropsophs eliani, uh, it has two clades, but for the Neuropsophs hubicondulus, I can see three major clades uh, for um, that species uh, in the SNP tree. Also, uh, I, the 16S was not as good, there's not much support when compared to the SNPs. Uh, I did the genetic clustering just to see if there is a uh, cl some genetic clustering among the species or uh, even the or even in uh, the species that I had more uh, samples, which was the Neuropsophs rubicundulus. And the Delta K uh, peaked in uh, four and six population clusters. And when I look the the graph, I only see that it changed for the Dendropsophs rubicundus species. 
So I used all that information, the phylogenetic trees and also the species, uh, the, the, the structure to uh, create the models that I tested for my species delimitation analysis. I did uh, 11 models that I lumped and split the species. And um, the model that was selected was the model a that shows all the species uh, separated. So the diversity in this group is underestimated. And also I couldn't find secondary contact when I did the, mo the demography of the only the species, uh, the Neuropsops rubicundus. So there is some gene flow and secondary contact for this um, um, the species. And looking uh, the diversification, I can see that uh, the uplift of the Brazilian shield and the climatic fluctuations, they were, uh, they kind of coincide with the diversification of this group. Uh, so um, uh, the this, endemic this species of this group, they also occur in the plateaus uh, uh, using the maps that I created. I could see that they, they were distributed in the plateaus. So the plateaus are climatic stable places for those species and they potentially diversified in that but in the plateaus. Also uh, the climatic um, fluctuations also promoted the isolation and reconnection of species of the Dendrobsoft subcondylus species. And overall there is a recent diversification around five million years ago. Uh, the future work with the Brazilian frogs is uh, integrate uh, taxonomy, taxonomic studies using morphological, ecological, bioacoustical, and genetic data to raise the species, uh, this lineage to species. Uh, also, it will increase uh, the, even more the number of species in neotropical savannas. And with that, I want to uh, acknowledge all uh, the herpetological collections, my collaborators, and the funding agencies. And with that, I'll take any questions. All right, so we've got time for one or two questions. If someone wants to raise their hand, we can call on you and get your question in. Yeah, I think uh, Henry, you can answer the question maybe. I think people were using the um, reaction for clapping rather than a, a hand raised. Um, so I didn't actually see any hands raised. <laughs> All right, so um, you talked a little bit about future work you want to do. Are mm -hmm. there any constraints that you had based on your, your data or your methods that you wished you could have gotten around, but just didn't have the opportunity to do so? Um, I wish I had more samples of the other species, to be honest. I didn't, uh, I mean, I ended up doing species limitation because I got samples of the Neuropsops of the Kundulus. And when I analyzed, it was just so many different clades. And then when I saw, oh, there are a bunch of different species, and I wish I, you know, I had more and more species of the other, other, the other species that I didn't know, <laughs> so I could, you know, have a better um, sampling for this study. That makes sense. I'm yeah. going to ask you to stop sharing your screen now, so that our next speaker can get set up. So Henry, you should be able to share your screen. Also remember to unmute yourself. Okay, <laughs> I don't hear it. Okay. Um... Hello, I'm Henry Elena Scastro, and um, I'm really excited of being here, like just presenting some of the results of my PhD. Uh, I'm going to be attending as well the 
per component of the meeting. So I'm really happy to keep talking about it. And I mean, I just realized that 15, 12 minutes is nothing to, to tell a whole story. So this is pretty much like it's going to be an overview of what, some of the things that I did. Um, for the Spanish speaking uh, attendees, um, voy a dar una charla un poco más extendida sobre este tema en dos semanas. Aquí está mi contacto de, en, en Twitter. Perdón, de hablar de sus temas con mayor calma que en otro espacio. Um, so, uh, let me tell you a little bit, of, a, a little bit more about uh, the evolution of mate choice in an Australian uh, wildflower. Uh, but first of all, I want to acknowledge that this research, this research was conducted on Aboriginal land, the unsettled land of the Jagera, Yucaralpul, and Turbal peoples. I pay my respect to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connection to country, past and continued enjoyment. So to start talking about the original new species, the traditional framework is studying like, what are the processes that prevent different groups to interweave? And this has been studied mostly uh, or has been divided uh, depending on when in the life cycle of the individuals uh, the, this barrier to interbreeding happens. So that life event that have differentiated uh, this study has been fertilization. So the events that happen after that has been considered like possible. Pure fertilization consider prezygotic barriers. However, most of the prezygotic barriers that has been studied so far are those that prevent mating to happen. But there are a multitude of organisms where mating is not a thing. So we are missing a big chunk of the picture of association and how reproductive isolation uh, happens. Uh, so it's really important to study like those creative barriers that pretty much occur after copulation, spawning, or pollination, depending on the group, and before fertilization. And pretty much all this is the realm of gam gametic interactions. It is also known as mating prezygotic barriers. So this is pretty much where I have been uh, in the last few years, um, just delving. Um, so. This kind of barrier has been understudied, but not because that they are uncommon. There's few studies in comparison with other kinds of barriers have demonstrated that it is like uh, widespread in both in animals and plants. And for their taxonomic biases, so some groups has been overstudied. I mean, insects or sophila. Uh, but yeah, we slowly are trying to catch up. Uh, our knowledge about like uh, cubitive reproductive barriers in plants. And although the focus when we talk about reproductive isolation in plants has been around pollination, uh, pollination is just the first step of the fertilization process. There are many things that need to happen between the moment where the pollen grains arrive on the stigma until the fertilization itself. The pollen grains needs to adhere, hydrate, germinate, grow a pollen tube for two different tissues, and finally finding the ovary and entering to the ovule. So this is a really coordinated process with both uh, the pollen, uh, the sperm cells of the pollens are taking an active part, but also the female reproductive uh, or tissues are nurturing and guiding the, the pollen tubes to accomplish this function. So, in general, processes like pollen, grain competition, male competition can occur, but also a female choice in the way of cryptic female choice. And eventually, this pro these phenomena can conduct to a reproductive isolation and has been classified in both non-competitive gametic isolation and competitive gametic isolation. Non-competitive gametic isolation is evident through single crosses where one female is made with one male there are simply differences between the species one being more efficient in fertilization than other other but competitive uh, gametic isolation is only evident when there are like competitive crosses in action that is like two different kinds of spare or pollen grains competing for fertilization and there is a phenomenon that is 
known as conicelicific amide present that occurs when one female has been simultaneously pollinated or mated, I'm going to take the language of plants, uh, has been simultaneously pollinated with pollen from two different species, one of those being from the same species that, as the female and the other from a different species. So fertilization is biased toward the gametes of the, of the male that is from the same species as the female. Uh, so I was interested in exploring this phenomenon in Senecio lautus, that is a, this Australian daisy that I, in my lab we have been like working with. And it's a really interesting system because um, it has been locally adapted to different or contrasting uh, eco ecosystems, uh, rocky headlands and sand dunes. And this local adaptation has occurred independently multiple of them. The question that I started with was, uh, I, I was pretty much interested in knowing what conspecific amid present was occurring in Senecio Lautus, and if it was, how it's evolving. So I took advantage of eight different populations of Senecio that has these offered me different contrasts. In geography, some of them were allopatric and others were parapatric. Uh, in ecology, some of them were dunes and others were headlands. And in phylogenetic history, some of them were closely related populations and other decently related populations. Uh, so there are different ways that or drivers or evolutionary patterns about the evolution of conspecific amid presence. One of the things that I was interested in testing was the coin and or classical patterns of accumulation of reproductive isolation with divergence, but also whether sexual conflict uh could drive the evolution of this because the interests of male and females can differ and the resolution of those conflicts in different populations can uh, cascade in the emergence of reproductive isolation also reinforcement whether those populations that are higher higher risk maladaptive hybridization have evolved con specific amid presence in comparison to the other or sexual selection sexual selection is a process that is happening within a population and eventually an exacerbate version of sexual selection can produce uh, reproductive isolation and lastly where somehow local adaptation could incidentally lead to the emergence of reproductive isolation uh, either through pleiotropy or a uh, linkage uh, so given the experimental design or the season that I had, I could test these three hypotheses or first current the coin and or pattern is present there for a uh, role of reinforcement and local adaptation in the evolution of coin specific and present. So in a different um, chapter of my PhD, I tested for sexual conflict, but those are results that I'm not including in this presentation. So this was my uh, experimental setup. Uh, I did uh, the crosses of all the females against all the males in this traditional experimental design. And really important, I generated a fertilization neural model because depending what is the viability of the pollen, the, the non-competitive gametic isolation, and also the survival, uh, of the offspring because I need to genotype the offspring to know the, the, the paternity of the offspring, of the seedlings. All this can contribute and generate the, uh, the signature of con specific amid present. So I just rule out the contribution of all these other factors and created uh, some expectation and, a, and in a statistical framework I, I tested and I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, later in the questions. And I also developed uh, a paternity assignment method based on pool se sequencing. Um, so these are the, the results. Uh, in, uh, in general terms, what I found was a really large variation in specific amid presence. So the pink colors corresponds to population pairs that has the signature of specific gamete present. And surprisingly, the blue ones are those that are showing the opposite pattern that is pretty much inbreeding avoidance. That was a surprise for me initially, but then made kind of sense. So the first thing that I can tell is like, yeah, conspecific amid presence is occurring in the system in some populations. 
consistent. So they are like an established mechanism. But in many other, I found the opposite signature that made me think that there are other processes within the population that are really important to take into account and that were not initially part of my experimental design, like genetic load, like is inbreeding the highest cost that these population have to set up interbreeding. And the other important result that I found here is that in, in relation to extrinsic reproductive barriers, when a specific amid presence is kind of quick. Uh, so probably they might not even have a, a chance to, to hybridize if these extrinsic uh, pre-pollination reproductive barriers are super strong. Uh, so in one way uh, I say this, and I will go back uh, in the next slide. And going a little bit further, I was interested not only in conspecific gamete presence, but I wanted to expand this to competitive gametic interactions in general. So I expand white cells and those new crosses that I did. But in summary, there is a new kind of cross that is really important. That is where the two kind of pollens none of them is from the same population that female. And what is the power here is that I prefer all possible crosses of males and females and be, I'm able to tease apart the contribution of pollen competition and female cryptic choice with this expanded set of experiments. Uh, and the result of this is that the only significant factor that contributed to the evolution of competitive genetic Interactions is the of the females. Uh, and in other words, it is saying that a female that is presented to the same options of pollens, one of them is going to have a, pre a strong preference from male A, for pollen from L, male L, A, sorry, and the other ecotype is going to have a, a strong preference for the opposite pollen. And in other words, this is suggesting that somehow local adaptation has an incidental effect on speciation, reproductive isolation. And this can occur either through a pleiotropy or linkage. And other results in our lab suggest that it's more pleiotropy because one of the strongest candidate genes for uh, the local adaptation that these plants present is endol one that is has been implicated as well in pollen tube perception. So that is, a way that we need to keep like digging to find that connection. So in summary, uh, I found that the yeah, Alcon specific amid presence has evolved in Senecio Lautus, uh, but there are no universal effects of phenomena like uh, reinforcement uh, that I was interested in. But we also need to keep this is a young season and the divergence between the different populations is less than 300,000 years. Uh, so probably it's normal for, for this kind of system. Also, extrinsic reproductive isolation is really strong in the season, and my, maybe those populations might not have the opportunity to uh, the pollen to exchange pollen. So there is not going to be a pressure to evolve on a specific amid presence. And lastly, we discovered that there is a connection between local adaptation and fertilization preferences. Uh, and we just need to adopt a reverse genetic. Uh, candidate. I have four questions, but I'm really happy to talk to everyone in Albuquerque if you are coming. Um, thank you. We will also have a little time at the very end because we only have five speakers in this one, but we do need to switch over to the next speaker. So Amazing. thank you. Yes, yeah, so I can go ahead and share screen. Yes, yes okay. you can. Excellent. And then you still see the the full screen view, right? Correct. All right. Excellent. Well, uh, well I'm John... just a moment. We're going to wait oh. until it actually hits 830, just in case people are moving back and forth between the different sessions. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no problem. We don't have a centralized chime system, unfortunately, despite what we've all gotten used to from years of the in-person conference. Yeah, no, no problem at all. All right, go ahead. 
Yeah, perfect. Well, I'm Josh Hoskinson. I am a PhD uh, student in biology here at Arizona State University. And here I'm actually going to talk a little bit about some work that I did in Rick Michaud's lab at the University of Arizona as part of my master's degree, in which um, this topic is going to be different than probably most topics that you will see here at Evolution, in which this is an education-centered one. So we were really interested to see if we could translate uh, current you know, scientific research to investigate an, uh, an active problem that we see in science teaching practice. And so for this particular one, I am going to uh, give an overview as to the application of evolutionary transitions and in individuality theory to talk about the evolution of the hierarchy of life through the development of a learning progression. So that, that's the general scope here. And so the problem that we have is that there is a demonstrated need to teach the evolution of the hierarchy of life. Um, there's a paucity of pedagogical content knowledge on how to teach macroevolution. That is to say that there is a shortage of knowledge of how to teach, um, of the knowledge of how to teach macroevolution. And so, you know, there have been some uh, areas such as deep time or tree thinking or speciation um, where there have been some um, elements developed. Uh, but there still needs to be more, um, especially when it comes to um, societal implications for the teaching of evolution, like evolution acceptance and evolution engagement. We really want um, to develop these well-defined you know, defined tools. And we have also identified the need to teach the hierarchy of life in general, uh, because it is the general overarching uh, organization of, of biology. It's really critical for students to understand how the hierarchy of life came to be, as opposed to just accepting its existence. Um, questions on how it originated and evolved still need to uh, be addressed. And in our view, the inclusion of evolutionary transitions in individuality theory would serve as that mechanism by which to explain the origin and evolution of the hierarchy of life. So in a nutshell, um, the idea here between evolutionary transitions is the transitions between what is considered an individual, which for our purposes is a unit of selection. And so what is the, the unit by which natural selection acts um, upon you know, an organism or a population or whatnot. So classically, we have uh, genes into genomes, and then we have the transition into prokaryotes, and then prokaryotes into the eukaryotic cell. And then we have multicellular um, organisms, and then we have the transition from multicellular organisms to eusocial societies that we see in eusocial insects, such as ants and bees and the such. Um, and so how can we take this framework, um, this uh, rich body of scientific knowledge, and apply it to this need that has been demonstrated in the education community? And that, we thought, was to create a learning progression. So learning progressions describe students' paths towards an increase in sophistication of knowledge. And so you start with a naive conception of uh, a topic. You know, in some cases, there's been tree thinking or natural selection or, or what have you. In this case, we're interested in the evolution of the hierarchy of life, how we start from a naive conception and move towards an expert level conception. Um, and so what are the different intermediate steps that uh, students go through to get from that naive conception to that expert level conception? And so we start with the lower anchor, which describes students' incoming knowledge. Um, and then we progress towards what's called the upper anchor, which defines the target level of sophistication that we're going for in the classroom. Um, if you notice here, I put end here in quotations because obviously with the progress of scientific research, there really is no end. It just keeps going. Um, but for our intents and purposes, um, we have to identify some kind of goal that we're going for. And so uh, developing a learning progression for evolutionary transitions and in individuality theory may be useful, a useful teaching tool um, to bring not only science into the classroom, but to teach this well-needed concept. And so 
a broad overview of this learning progression is that we start with our lower anchor of groups or collections of individuals that cooperate. And then we postulate that there are four different stages that students would go through in order to reach the um, upper anchor, which is the hierarchical organization of life is due to repeated evolution of different kinds of individuals. And so for the remainder of the talk, we're going to talk about exactly how, in, in a stepwise manner, how we bring that scientific research into the classroom in a way um, that is understandable by um, a lay audience. And so the first level, like I said, is with the role of groups. And so we start with the idea that groups are collections of individuals that cooperate. And here we're just talking about an individual in the vernacular, like you or myself or, you know, uh, an animal, that sort of thing. Um, and then we are progressing towards our first intermediate step, which is groups can do things that individuals cannot. And so we want to teach three specific key concepts that we viewed were important. So one is groups are collections of individuals that interact or depend on each other, and that there are some tasks that you can do on your own, and there are some tasks that are better um, accomplished via a group. And that being part of a group can uh, benefit uh, the individuals that are participating uh, by affecting their survival. Uh, this can be applied to different groups by, you know, uh, the, the recognition of, you know, if we work together, then whatever goal um, that we have um, is easier accomplished if we work together as opposed to you working by yourself and me working by myself. And so moving from that, the second level moves from this general idea of groups and adding in this social element of cooperation. So we take this intermediate um, that we identified earlier, that groups can do things individuals cannot, and we want to get um, to cooperation helps individuals survive, but cheating can harm the group because not only are we going to be focusing on the role of cooperation in biology and the cooperation and social interactions, but the role of cheating and how cheating can influence it. So we want to talk about the definition of cooperation, which is how two or more individuals um, interact and benefit from working together. Uh, members can cooperate, but cheating can occur. And that participation and cooperation can increase the survival, uh, but too much cheating can decrease the survival of group members. The third level focuses on individuality. And the interesting part here that uh, we were very, um, you know, uh, cognizant in dealing with is that the first two levels of this learning progression, we're talking about uh, things that are common in, in normal parlance, right? When I talk about a group or I talk about cooperation of individuals within a group, um, you more or less can follow what I'm talking about, right? But here, when we're talking about individuality, we're shifting from that uh, naive conception really to uh, you know, more of that expert level conception and talking about, you know, an individual is not just you or myself, but an individual is something that natural selection can act on. And so we're shifting to uh, presenting a definition of an evolutionary individual are entities that can survive or reproduce on their own. Just like before in our example, we had genes that are, you know, uh, evolutionary individuals of their own, and those transition into genomes and so forth and so on. Um, there are different types of individuals, such as those that I previously mentioned, and those individuals can form groups, and individuals can cooperate through specialization and division of labor. So uh, when we're, you know, say you and I are cooperating, um, it's much easier to accomplish a task or to accomplish a goal if I perform some tasks and you perform others in, in such a way that we don't necessarily compete with each other for energy or resources or whatnot, and that um, there, there's an inherent mutualism there. And so the final level really has this application of groups and cooperation and individuality into directly um, applying it 
to the problem of the evolutionary uh, of the evolution of the hierarchy of life. And so we have our last intermediate here, which individuals survive and reproduce and can be studied as social groups. And then we move to our upper anchor, which is the hierarchical organization of life is due to these repeated kinds of uh, transitions in individuality. So we're really focusing on the role of natural selection here. Natural selection can act on individuals both within and between groups. Natural selection on groups promotes the formation of integrated cooperating groups of evolutionary individuals. And then this is the key part right here that um, we've had quite a bit um, of trouble, you know, having students do it. So this is a lot of scaffolding that needs, you know, to happen here and to be created to support this last piece is that members of a group of cooperating individuals can become so integrated that they evolve into a new kind of individual because that's really the key concept that we're going here in that you know we have this transition using cooperative and social behavior from just a you know a cooperative group of evolutionary individuals and going into a cohesive unit that can't be separated because then the constituent parts can no longer survive and reproduce on their own and that you know the overall present here of that life is a nested hierarchy of different kinds of individuals and so in the uh, story of life once again we have the genes the genomes genomes the prokaryote cells prokaryote cells the eukaryotic cells um, these all mimic these simple cooperative structures and um, that can be traced through the four billion um, year history of life. And so just coming back here, um, the interesting part here is we have that learning progression, this axis here of sophistication of knowledge, starting from a more um, naive conception and moving towards um, you know, this upper anchor here of a more expert level conception. Of, of evolution. And so then we have the four stages, groups, cooperation, individuality, and the hierarchy of life. And we think that through this learning progression, we would be able to support student learning and actually bring this very complicated problem from the scientific literature and actually bring it into the classroom. And current work right now is actually investigating the use of this learning progression in the role of investigating student evolution acceptance and engagement with evolution. So that's where we're moving forward on this project. I wanted to thank the Michaud Lab for all of their support and guidance here. Our team members that worked on this project are on the left here. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of other collaborators that provided their useful insight. And then this work was supported by an NSF grant in the Michaud Lab. So thank you so much, and I'm open to questions. Thank you. All right, we've got a question here from Brian. Brian, go ahead and unmute. Uh, thanks for this. Um, one thing that's a little odd is the prokaryote to eukaryote part of your hierarchy in that like, mm. we often teach about like nested groups and natural clays. So prokaryotes aren't a natural group, right? Mm -hmm. so, I can see why you're making this simplification of students' evolution hierarchy, but there's a cost then of them misunderstanding how evolution works. And so, how do you balance that cost? Right, exactly. And so, the there are you know some simplifications and a lot of those details of the transitions themselves we don't really cover, um, which is, is a pro and a con. We just focus on, on the mechanism itself and really understanding the role of cooperation in providing this, ne uh, this nested hierarchy. Um, but going into that detail is definitely something that we need to do and something that um, we need to consider if we're going to bring this to more like advanced students in terms of high school students and college students and the like. I hope that answered your question. All right, thank you, Josh. We're gonna have to have you stop sharing your screen so that our next okay. person can get set up. Okay, um, uh, I'm uh, Sankar Subramanian. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of the Sunshine Coast. So this is our campus and um, I'm gonna talk about the uh, genomic footprints of bottleneck in uh, landlocked salmon populations. Okay, first I would like to acknowledge the uh, traditional custodians of the land on which 
uh, we live, work, and study. And I pay my respect to the local indigenous elders, past, present, and emerging. Okay, first let me start with uh, you know the island rule or the Foster's rule. So Bristol Foster uh, observed around 116 uh, species uh, in Ireland and in their counterparts in mainland. So an, a deer in Ireland and the same deer in the mainland, the same species. And then he uh, uh, recorded their uh, morphology size. And based on that, he had hypothesized that certain species evolved smaller, which he called dwarfism, and, and uh, other species got bigger, so gigantism. So for some of the examples are, um, you know, hippopotamus in islands were small, found to be small, and the mammoth uh, in Wrangell Island found to be small. And the uh, rodents, like uh, the St. Kilda uh, mouse or the, um, uh, the bull. Uh, so the reasons, as you can uh, like predict, so the resource limitation caused uh, island population to become smaller. And uh, for uh, the small animals, small mammals, uh, the absence of predation gives them, you know, to grow larger. So later, um, several years, several, several studies conducted on island population in comparison with the mainland ones uh, using the genetic data, they found uh, Predominantly, they were like based on few genes and mitochondrial DNA and microsatellites. So they found out uh, a low heterozygosity in uh, island population compared to the mainland population. You know, just for an example, this is a dingo population in Australia. This is mainland dingoes and uh, dingoes in uh, the island, small island called Crazer Island. And these studies also found uh, like a accumulation of deleterious uh, mutations. So this was identified by looking at the, you know, the diversities in non-synonymous and synonymous uh, sites and taking that, looking at the ratio. So all these point out like, you know, there's a significant reduction in the effective population size in Ireland. And later when we got the, you know, large data, like whole genome data, uh, a number of studies examine the other genomic features like the uh, runs of homozygosity and uh, non-synonymous uh, uh, variations and uh, the homozygosity of deleterious uh, variation and also the loss of function variants like the ones that cause um, uh, that introduces stop codons and affects um, transcription splicing. So these, the major studies were conducted in um, on uh, Chan Channel Island Forks and uh, Wrangell Island um, in uh, of, on a mammoth in uh, Wrangell Island and the Stewart Island of uh, New Zealand, Kakapu birds and the Isle Royal wolf. So these are some of the recent examples using whole genome data so to you know, distinguish the um, genomic signatures between island and mainland population. So if you look at the island and mainland, you can say uh, island is basically a land surrounded by water. In the same way, you know, it's similar, but in a ge different geographical structure is where a water, water body like lake or river, the river that doesn't flow into uh, ocean, so insular river, are surrounded by land. So these are the landlocked water bodies. So these are, you know, in a way, they are similar but different ge uh, geological structures. So previous studies compared the uh, terrestrial animal populations in islands versus mainland. 
So in this study, we sort of uh, doing this for um, aquatic population and comparing uh, population in a landlocked river was compared to ocean. So, so we did this uh, study on uh, Atlantic salmon. So you know, uh, salmon uh, they they are they are called anadromous, which uh, migrate from sea to river for spawning. So some of the so the general Atlantic salmons are anadromous, but there are few pockets where you have a land landlocked lakes predominantly in uh, uh, North America, like uh, northeast of uh, United States and south of um, Canada, and in the Scandinavian countries. There are different pockets where you find uh, lakes and rivers that are landlocked. So salmons live there. So these salmons, so we wanted to examine the evolution of the salmon in comparison with the anadromous one. So just by looking at you know, the size, the anadromous salmon, the one that go back and forth between like ocean and uh, rivers, the size is like 75 centimeters. You know, the way they, the, the, people, and the two guys are holding them, it tells you the size difference. And the landlocked ones are 25 centimeters, almost three times smaller. So this is another like sort of example for the dwarfism. Um, suggested by Foster. And we got our genome data from a previous study, uh, predominantly in uh, Norway. Uh, one, one of those locations is uh, 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 Nansen River, that's number two, which is a landlocked one. And we also got uh, samples from the same river, which is what that part was not landlocked, that flew into the ocean. And then we also got samples from uh, north and uh, south and uh, east and west uh, um, directions, like uh, the White Sea and Baltic Sea, and um, uh, the other rivers like, uh, sorry, okay. And then, then using the uh, whole genome data, we constructed a neighbor joining tree using 1.2 million uh, SNPs. As you can see, this is the landlocked uh, salmon. So it shows that this Namsen, so both are from the landlocked and this one, they are from the same river, but this one is the landlocked part of the river. So this says that um, this, this, this group, um, the uh, landlocked salmon separated from uh, the remaining group before uh, the um, Namsen and the Seldal Slagen uh, uh, populations diverged. So all these names are like the names of rivers in Norway. Then we estimated the uh, whole genome, um, I mean, population genetic parameters. So first we used the whole genome diversity using the millions of SNPs. So we found the landlocked one was uh, much smaller, like the point triple zero three seven. And the anadromous one ranges from triple zero five six to six seven. So it's pretty much non-overlapping and almost uh, two times difference. So there's a significant reduction in the heterozygosity. So next, uh, we looked at the uh, uh, runs of homozygosity. We looked at the uh, fragments that are greater than one um, MB, and we counted those numbers. So the landlocked ones were almost uh, 1180. The anadromous ranges from 153 to six, uh, 608. And again, it's pretty much like a two-fold difference. And then uh, we also looked at the total size, total size of this ROH. So that size roughly is uh, 400 MB for landlocked and uh, 50 to 200 for the anadromous uh, salmon. So again, you know, everything shows a two-fold difference. 
then we looked at the uh, you know accumulation of uh, the profile of active accumulation of deleterious mutations. So for that we use the uh, DNDS ratio. The diversity is estimated for non-synonymous and synonymous SNPs, and then we correlated that with uh, the effective population size, which we calculated. In a very simple way, you know, uh, using the mutation rate of three to ten power minus nine uh, mutations per generation. So this mu uh, mutation rate was obtained from um, three independent studies on uh, Siamese fighter, a Malawi chiclet, and Atlantic herring. But they all showed more or less, you know, the same range around three, um, and they were based on whole genome comparing, you know. Um, parent of offspring uh, sets. So they identify the number of mutations in between parents and off, offspring. And using that mutation rate, you know, you can replace, uh, you can substitute that mutation rate to estimate the population size. So, so we found a you know, negative correlation between the ratio and uh, uh, any. Then just looking at the average, uh, DNDS, we see a much higher uh, DNDS ratio for landlocked around uh, 0 0.46 and uh, for an anadromous one, 3, 3, 4, 4, 3. So, and uh, in our previous studies, we saw uh, an overabundance of uh, homozygosity or homozygous deleterious variants in uh, um, island population. So, we did a similar uh, analysis. So we first looked at the non-synonymous SNPs and then uh, estimated the proportion of homozygous counts you know, with respect to the heterozygous plus homozygous. So the landlocked populations had almost 60% uh, uh, homozygous uh, SNPs. The NRMS one got 42 to 48. Uh, and uh, even when, when we looked at the number, the homozygous SNP number, the landlocked one was uh, almost uh, 20,000, and uh, the anadromous uh, salmon had 15 to 17,000. So we did pretty much uh, the same kind of study using now using the deleterious uh, SNPs, where we defined a deleterious SNP as uh, which uh, had a, a GURP score, which is the genome evolutionary rate profiling method. So based on that, uh, whichever SNP had a score of more than four was considered deleterious. And then we did the same analysis, uh, counting the proportion of uh, homozygous uh, SNPs. So the landlock had 68% homozygous deleterious SNPs, and the NADAM has got 45 to 55%. Um, and the counts, the landlocked at 644, and the Anadromous and, and got around uh, less than five, uh, around 500, 500 to 550. And uh, finally, we also looked at uh, the loss of function uh, SNPs, which are the uh, SNPs that uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, stop codons. And uh, the, the landlocked again got a much higher proportion of homozygous. Uh, uh, loss of function SNPs, then anadromous with respect to the uh, percentage or proportion, and also in terms of uh, the counts of homozygous SNPs. So the, all these analysis in generally, like you know, I'll point out like um, you know, we, when we conducted four types of uh, analysis on uh, different types of genomic signatures, we found. Um, low heterozygosity for the landlocked ones and uh, high number and size of uh, ROH fragments in landlocked ones and uh, more deleterious mutations and more homozygous deleterious mutations and loss of function SNPs. You're at 15 minutes. We're going to have to ask you to wrap this up. Yeah, so so you know, so this is distinct, and the results were very similar to what we observed for the island pop and mainland population. So I think um, I acknowledge uh, my co-author and the university, and this was published in scientific report.
All right, so we don't have any time for questions specific here, but because this was our last speaker of the session, and the session does technically run for a little bit longer, at this point, if people have any questions for any of the speakers in this session, you're welcome to raise your hand and ask something. I will ask you to currently stop sharing your screen just because, you know, it may or may not be going to you specifically. Okay. All right, Alex. Hi, um, Sankar. Um, I did want to ask um, in, in your last talk, thank you, thank you for the talk. Uh, with these yeah. language populations, you might expect that the selection would be particularly relaxed on genes that are involved in living in, in oceans, right? Um, do you see do you see any signal of that? So you know, salt tolerance, that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the kind of analysis we are, uh, you know, gene-specific analysis we would like to do uh, in the near future. Yes, that is on our list. Um, uh, and we have uh, quite more data now. So that would be interesting, yeah. Great, thank you. Oh, Rio, go ahead. Is it okay? I have one question about the NDS ratio. You said like about natural selection, but I see your data like average located around 0 0.45. And uh, I understand the natural selection is larger than one. So did you find uh, like the NDS ratio like larger than one, or you found only like 0 0.45 or something like Peter low ratio? Yeah, I mean, uh, when we compare uh, DNDS ratio less than one, so mm -hmm. those indicate a purifying selection, level of purifying selection. So when population size become small, then the uh, selection is relaxed then you will get a higher DNDS ratio. So more bad mutations are as a segregating in the population. They were, they were not removed. So we will generally uh, expect a higher DNDS for small population. Okay, I understand, thank you. Mm -hmm. 